I, uh, last week I kind of wasted a perfectly good uh, illustration that uh, really goes with our passage this week. We're actually going to be talking about the transfiguration story, mostly in Matthew 17. And uh, the illustration I gave was the uh, baseball bat one. I, if you remember, I talked about, uh, in my neighborhood anyway, when we were kids and we were picking a team, we had this ritual where you threw a bat to one guy and then you went with your hands and then somebody would crown the top to decide who was going to be going first. And I said in, in the previous story of the who do you say I am, who do people say that I am, um, that story happened in Caesarea Philippi, and I talked about all the layers of idolatry and the different false gods they worshipped, and Jesus was putting his foot down. Um, he, he was kind of at the top, taking the crown and, and declaring that. Well, you know, I realized uh, that, that whole chapter in, in Matthew chapter 16, this whole context of authority and who's on top, who's in charge, that... Matthew 16, verse 1 says this, One day the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test Jesus, demanding that they show them, that he show them a miraculous sign from heaven to prove his authority. That's, that's interesting because that's at the beginning of chapter 16, and we're going to be in chapter 17, still very much on this same theme about authority. Um, I want you to think about the transfiguration story in relation to Peter's story today. Don't forget that uh, this is a Peter series that we're on, and uh, you might be thinking, isn't the transfiguration, especially of all stories, totally about Jesus? Like, you know, Pastor John, why don't you just drop the Peter angle and just stick with the text and talk about what it really focuses on? Well, I thought about that. I, I nearly did that. I thought, am I, am I really forcing this kind of little series theme of uh, this idea of Peter being a seminal disciple and my kind of force feeding it into this passage. Well, here's my angle. The only reason we know this story even happened in the first place is because Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote about it. The only reason they are writing about it and know about it is because Peter, John, and James witnessed it happening. And they only witnessed it happening because Jesus specifically called them to come with them on this trip up the mountain to see it all happen. We're going to see in our story that some conversation goes around. Um, Moses and Elijah and Jesus are talking about what's about to take place in his life. So, so there's, there's some kind of um, conversation, message, but we don't know a whole lot of what is being said. Um, but it seems very important that this whole thing is observed by these three men, by these disciples, and particularly Peter is a key character in this. So this story is about a revelation. It's a display in every sense of the word. It's for the benefit of the three, not simply for Jesus. It's must-see TV for every disciple who will depend on the apostolic testimony concerning who Jesus is. You know, if you think about it, um, verse 1 says, Jesus took Peter and the two. Jesus took Peter and the two so they could see this thing happen that we're going to be thinking about today. So as we consider the transfiguration today, I want us to kind of do it from through Peter's eyes, through the eyes of a disciple. We want to find out what are we supposed to be hearing, seeing, learning from this incredible mountaintop experience. And it's an incredible experience. It's a doozy in Peter's life. Well, how do I know that? Because Peter had a lot of doozy experiences. Like a couple weeks ago, we looked at him walking on the water. That's a pretty big experience, I think, that you'd remember. Well, this happens to be the only experience that Peter has with Jesus during his public ministry that makes it into... Uh, either of Peter's two letters. This is the only one he mentions. It's the only one he brings up again. So it's obviously a very influential P, uh, story for Peter becoming who he is. You know, he doesn't mention water walking, dead raised, feeding of thousands. Just this one story gets referenced. So obviously it had a huge impact on Peter. So let's go mountain climbing with Jesus and the disciples and uh, read the story here today. Um, the, the last uh, chapter ended with this line. 
And a lot of commentators think, I mean, Jesus is talking about a lot of things. There's a lot of way you can read the last verse of chapter 16, but it certainly seems to flow well right into chapter 17. And remember these chapter divisions and numbers that are inserted here? Those are just there for us to find our way around so we know where to turn. Um, so, you know, as you're reading it, it makes sense to start at chapter 16, verse 28. And I tell you the truth, Jesus said, some standing here right now will not die before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. If we were writing a screenplay for this story, we would start listing the characters and uh, the significant details that are important for uh, you know, visualizing and putting this uh, story together. The first one is this idea of a time stamp. Uh, it starts right out at the beginning, six days later. That just sounds like a minor detail, but if you have a Bible with you, you can turn back to uh, Exodus chapter 24, because um, that's just not a random number. That's just not, oh, okay, so then a week later they did this. Matthew's choosing those words, six days later. Um, if we look at Exodus chapter 24, it's a very important chapter in the life of Israel's history, and uh, Here's, this is, the, the exodus has happened, they're, they're freed, and, and God's giving his covenant to Israel. Moses is going to be kind of dialoguing with God. God's going to be laying out the Ten Commandments, all of that kind of stuff. Um, in, in verse 24, then the Lord instructed Moses, come up here to me and bring along Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of Israel's elders. All of you must worship from a distance. Here's all these ideas of the holiness of God and how dangerous it is to be in God's presence. But there's also a little indicator there of a, of a little sample size. There's a million people down there at the foot of this mountain, a million plus, and only a few are coming up to this important meeting. Um, only Moses is allowed to come near to the Lord. The others must not come near, and none of the other people are allowed to climb up the mountain with him. Then Moses went down to the people and repeated all the instructions and regulations the Lord had given him. And the people said, we will do everything the Lord's commanded. Then Moses carefully wrote down all the Lord's instructions. Early the next morning, got up and built an altar at the foot. Um, took 12 pillars going down and down to 15. I'm going to skip a lot of the details. Then Moses climbed up the mountain and the cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it. For six days. And on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from inside the cloud. To the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, the glory of the Lord appeared at the summit like a consuming fire. Then Moses disappeared into the cloud as he climbed higher up the mountain and he remained there. So there's this idea of this six day delay and, and God's glory being revealed to the people. That's, there's a lot behind that little, little words here from Matthew of six days later. Um, up a high mountain, that's another kind of important feature. 
uh, where do you think we get expressions like mountaintop experiences? It's, a, it's, very, it's very important. It was written there in Exodus 25, and there's other examples of these summit meetings between uh, God and, and his uh, leaders. There's also the temptation toward idolatry in the high places. <laughs> the high places in the Old Testament aren't always, that's not always a flattering term. They're always tempted to put idols and Asherah poles and all the pagan religions would have their false gods up on the high places. Well, this is going up to a high place, but to meet with the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Jesus is obviously a key feature. I don't, I'm not going to right now talk about that too much because most of this sermon will be explaining who he is, as every sermon should. Um, Peter and the brothers. Again, I already pointed out in the uh, Exodus 24 example, a limited representative sample size of disciples. So, so that's a little bit of a, of a parallel of what's going on here. But it's not just Peter by himself either. Peter's the main character, but it's interesting that when Jesus um, wants this display to happen and he specifically wants some disciples to, to experience this, it's not just Peter by himself. And there's a few reasons for that. In the Old Testament, again, um, testimony, the testimony legally needed to be more than just one person. So they're meant to be witnesses of what they, so here's three witnesses. But I think there's even something more profound in this is in that it's, you know, we, we have a plaque out there. I just re-noticed it uh, going out to look at the portable this morning right there at the exit. There's that verse where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am with them. And, and that's being acted out right here in this story. Jesus doesn't just take a disciple, but he takes disciples in community to reveal uh, the glory of who he is. We've got two other characters. We've got Moses in our story that we just read. Um, Moses is a lot of things. He, it, it, you can't underestimate how revered he was in, in Jewish tradition, especially at this time. Um, uh, you can look back if you, if, you, if you like getting into strange details in the Old Testament. You might not know this or you might not remember it, but there's a little passage tucked away in the Old Testament about the fact that nobody really knows where Moses' burial place was. You know, Moses did die without entering the promised land, but there's this idea that God buried him himself. Nobody really knows. They, they didn't really know where Moses' burial site was. That makes sense with the whole tendency to of idolatry and veneration of, of great people and all of that. I'm not sure what, but it's, it's there. So that's one little idea about Moses. That just shows you how revered he was and how crucial he was. But he also represents the law. He represents the Torah. He represents the, a big part of the Old Testament. You can't underestimate how important the law is. And when we hear that Moses is there, we just think the guy. You know, we, we see Charlton Heston there with the white beard, and, and we think of the person. But, but Moses is, is, he's like an office by himself. He, he's, a, he's a big chunk of the Bible. Moses represents the law, and he's there. Elijah. Um, again, an interesting thing about Elijah is uh, he saved a lot of money on uh, end-of-life expenses because he went direct deposit. He was just taken up into heaven. So there was no burial place for Elijah, and uh, he was taken up, and he represents the prophets. So Moses and Elijah, we're talking the law and the prophets. When my kids were little, we used to, they used to listen to this uh, Bible CD series, uh, um, kids' musicals called Salty. And the main character is this little guy, this guy Salty, that was a, a hymn book, a psalm book, or the book of Psalms, for, you know, walking around uh, this book doing his, doing his parts because they were all just radio dramas. Well, here, when, when these three disciples, Peter, James, and John, they look up and they see glowing Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. What's going on here? You can't imagine, you can't overstate, even though they, they, we know we're going to, we, we realize they're gonna, there's a whole lot they have to learn. They don't get it fully yet, but you couldn't have a higher imagined level summit meeting for these three devout God-following Jewish men 
than to be observing, to be at a conference with the law and the prophets and the Messiah all together at the same time. You, you can't, I think it's impossible for us to, to really put it, like to how, how much authority and how much power, tradition, significance for these three men would be represented in what they're seeing happening before their eyes. So that's just the, the people. And then another character here, then there's the voice. The voice, again, as I mentioned in an earlier sermon, when we talked about the brackets and Jesus' baptism where God says from heaven, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased, God only makes two audibles in the life story of Jesus. Two times he speaks from heaven in an audible voice. And I, and I said, the fact that it's verbatim the same thing both times with three additional words this time, I'll get back to that, but you can't underestimate how important that message is. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Um, so that's all the players. Let's just continue and soak in on, on, on what it's all about. What's the impact on the seminal disciple? What's it meant to be on him and through him on us? Uh, I don't like to do this too often, but there's also details about the transfiguration that the other Gospels give. I usually just try to stick with the one that's in front of me. But um, from Luke and Mark, the detail that's not in Matthew is that Jesus is transformed or transfigured in this way while he's praying. Now, I don't want to read too much into that, but uh, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty significant idea. That when this happens is while Jesus is praying. What would it have been like to have observed that? Pretty incredible. Um, Luke reports that uh, while the conversation is going on between Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, the disciples fall asleep. That's somewhat comforting to preachers everywhere. Um, Luke reports that Moses and Elijah were also glorious to see, but none of them report how they even know that it's Moses and Elijah. Oh, they got name tags. Are they recognizing them from the movie? I'm kind of kidding now. But we don't really know how they knew that that was Moses and Elijah. The text doesn't really tell us that. But it's interesting because in the last story, we were reminded when Peter said, you are the, you are the anointed one, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Peter. Nobody else told you this. This was revealed to you by heaven. So I think there's a little bit of that going on here in this story as well. They just seem to know, just like they did with Jesus. Luke reports some content. This is this idea of Jesus' exodus. In the, in the passage at Luke, it says that Moses and Elijah were speaking to Jesus about his coming exodus, what's about to happen to him. And we're thinking, interesting, there they are, and uh, they are focused in talking about Christ's deliverance of his people through his death on the cross that was coming. That was, that was the most significant thing that the two most significant Old Testament characters could have in a conversation with the Messiah, the most significant person. And 2,000 years later, it's still the most significant thing that any of us could talk about. And, and you know that expression we have where it's all they could talk about. Like when something happens that catches people's attention, you know, all of a sudden there's a big thing that happens. Like sometimes it's just crazy stuff like OJ going down the highway in a white Bronco. And the next day it's all anybody could talk about. It's all they could talk about. Or your kid's excited about their birth. It's all they could talk about. I think it would be pretty cool if the reputation of Renaissance Baptist Church out there in the world was concerning Christ's great sacrifice his death on the cross. You know that church? That Baptist church over there on Vipon? That's all they can talk about is Jesus and his great sacrifice. That's, that's all they're talking about here. And, and we don't know what it is that is shared. The transfiguration itself, someone's pointed out that it's not so much that Jesus is transformed as it is that the disciples are enabled to see Jesus for who he really is. I don't want to push on that point too much because it's still kind of speculation. It's still kind of reading into it, but we get the idea that 
Jesus doesn't get something here in this experience that he never had before. It's not like um, there's some kind of two-part um, kind of construction of the fully God, fully man, God incarnate that Jesus is. This is, this is the glory that has always been within him. And it's like the veil, the blinders are off these three men in this one experience to just be able to see Jesus for who he actually really is. So what we want to dig at today is what difference is that supposed to make? What's the difference it made in their lives? How, why is that so important for our faith that they saw this thing happen? Um, well, this much is clear. It's the ultimate summit conference. The topic's the ultimate topic. And Peter does something next that's incredibly helpful for each and every one of us. If Peter doesn't do what he does next, we perhaps don't really hear what we really need to hear. It, that there's something more going on here in this experience than some kind of um, hyper-spiritual laser light show going on in a mountaintop experience. Well, what does Peter do that benefit, benefits you and I so much? He makes a mistake. He's usually indirectly made fun of for it. Um, even Mark points out uh, that he said this, going to talk about Peter is going to blurt something out, and while he's speaking, God is going to interrupt him with the voice from heaven. But Mark says he said this because he didn't know what else to say, for they were all terrified. And what did he say? In the Philip's literal translation, it's a bit, bit disjointed, but he translates it as this, verse 4. And Peter answering to, said to Jesus, Sir, it is good to us to be here, if thou wilt, or if you will, we may make here three booths for thee one and for Moses one and one for Elijah. Booths, tabernacles, different interpretations. And interpreters make different conclusions on what Peter's thinking is. Why, why does he blurt this out? What's Peter offering to do? What is it that he's trying to accomplish when he says this? Um, some, some people think it's just out of a desire to, to do something to be of help, you know, wanting the three of them to be taken care of. So it's, it's, it's like wanting to, okay, this is amazing. You guys are doing this. You know, here's something that I can do to serve and help. Here, let us serve you. Some people think of it as an attempt to manage or control the situation because this phenomenal thing is happening. So he's like, well, let's, let's capitalize on this. Let's keep it happening. Let's, let's set up shop here. We could sell tickets to this thing. Let's make this last. We're going to set up permanent booths, memorials, tabernacles for you here. People are going to want to see this. Some people think that it's out of safety concerns. What do I mean by that is respect. In that Exodus chapter, it talked about the fact no one but Moses should be getting up here close to what's going on here. This is a high risk. This is a dangerous work site. So God would be enveloped in a cloud, or Moses would meet God from inside a, a tent of meeting. And, and we remember those stories where Joshua was waiting outside the tent, guarding it, and when Moses would come out, his face would be glowing, but he'd cover it then until the glowing ceased. And so Peter might be, this might be out of respect, might be like, we shouldn't even be seeing this. Let me build a booth. for this. And that kind of fits in with the terror element. Right? Because we see that terror reaction, um, and, and that fits in. Um, some, and this is the one that I usually latch on to, think that it, it's, it's the highest amount of respect. Peter's trying to verbalize the most flattering comment he could possibly make. Remember I said for these three devout Jewish males, for the law and the prophets and the Messiah to be here on the mountaintop? Remember, just in the last story, Peter's proclaimed Jesus to be the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Peter, you didn't learn this from men. This was revealed to you by God. Blessed are you. Now, don't tell anybody else about this yet. Because here we are, and still in Peter's mind, the most flattering thing he could possibly think of is, Jesus, it's you and Moses and Elijah. Let me make tabernacles for the three of you. P 
Peter may be still thinking this is some kind of promotion for Jesus. Or he's finally getting the respect due him. He's finally being put in the right echelon instead of being underappreciated or, or thought low of. Um, a long time ago, uh, J.I. Packer's book, Knowing God, I, I think I quoted this already because I remember Justine running out to buy it to read it. It's always awesome. Um, that the difference between, like we, we think, we can think we're worshiping God, but if all we're worshiping is our best imaginary picture of who God is, we still might be just practicing idolatry. Like that God is much bigger and greater than our highest thoughts of Him, but we're ever called to go deeper and further in our knowledge of who he is. Well, in this case, I think that's part of what Peter's about to learn. That here's Jesus and the law and the prophets, the Messiah, the law and the prophets. It couldn't get much better than this. Peter's just about to find in a difficult way that God's able to do beyond what we could ever ask or imagine. Because Peter's about to find out that Jesus is much more than he could even ask or imagine. Um, no matter how you interpret Peter's motives or message, like I said, he does this all a great favor. He sort of takes one for the team. Uh, I mean, they're all terrified. And after some of the things that uh, we've seen to this point, if he's still terrified in this experience, we can grade him on the curve. But I think the favor he did is just like every class you've ever been in where some kid puts his hand up and asks a question and it's like, oh, I wanted to ask that question, but I didn't want to admit that I didn't know the answer or whatever. You know, Peter, Peter's that guy in the class for us right now. He, he makes the mistake of, of making the dumb suggestion that all the rest of us end up learning from. Let's look at his suggestion and let's look at what happens in verse 5. This is, this is verse 5 in a few different versions. I've got them on slides here. Young's literal translation. While he is yet speaking, lo, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and lo, a voice out of the cloud saying, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I did delight, hear him. English Standard Version. He was still speaking when a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the clouds said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. There's those additional three words. I mentioned the line is said in His baptism. It's said here again, but with that additional three words. Listen to Him. We looked a few sermons ago that the promise was a prophet like Moses was going to come, and Israel was told, You are to listen to Him when he comes. The message, while he was going on like this, babbling, a light radiant cloud enveloped them and sounding from deep in the cloud a voice, this is my son marked by my love, focus of my delight, listen to him. Notice nobody really translates listen to him differently. King James, New King James Version, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased to hear him. The faithful, and Peter, James, and John are definitely included in the faithful, expected the Messiah to be the one who would come with the power of Elijah and who would be a prophet like Moses. And like I already hinted at this morning, God's statement is perhaps the greatest example of all time of how he is able to do abund exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we can ask or imagine. Thus, my baseball bat, Illustration, boom. We already saying crown him. Whoever won that decision of who's going up to bat first was by going over the top and crowning. Jesus, through these words, is crowned. It's a whole different kind of authority. Uh, we're going to see what this means for the Moses and Elijah idea. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Here's another angle. We're big on biblical authority around here. Or at least we like to think we are. If Moses and Elijah do represent the law and the prophets, if they really are the personification of the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures, and they 
then are also put in their place in this story. Peter gets put in his place, right? God says these words, they fall down terrified. But the Old Testament scriptures, in a way, get put in their place here. What do I mean by that? Um, Well, if we can see Moses and Elijah as representing the scriptures or the faith of their ancestors or even the ongoing biblical history leading up to the arrival of Jesus, we have the disciples being taken to this on-purpose display. Before their very eyes, the lights are cranked up. A display of Jesus' glory is revealed to them. They're enabled to see what was always there or hidden, however you want to look at it. And look at verse 8. And when they looked up, this is after they've been flattened down in fear. We're going to come back to the reaction. When they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. Moses and Elijah are gone, and they see only Jesus. Incredibly significant for understanding this story. What's the key for understanding the Old Testament? Well, that's not the right question. The right question is, who is the key to understanding the Old Testament? And the answer is Jesus. If you follow Jesus and his teaching in the Gospels, you'll see that he thinks that the importance of the Old Testament scriptures are not erased by his arrival. We have some bad thinking. You'll hear people say things in conversations about difficult Old Testament passages, and by difficult I don't mean the, well, how come this king came before this one, but in this one it seems... I don't mean those difficult... I mean the difficult ones that are clear to understand, that are like moral and ethical from the Old Testament. And people will hear those and they'll say, oh yeah, well, that's Old Testament. You know, because we're, we're New Testament Christians. You know, Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead, so that has nothing to do with us. That, that's not what it means when Moses and Elijah suddenly disappear and all they see is Jesus. Now, I think one lesson that seminal disciple Peter and the brothers learn is they look up and see only Jesus remains. That's the same thing that happens when when we've seen Jesus for who he really is, and we go back to the old stories from Moses and Elijah in the Old Testament. We learn the passages aren't understood until they're understood in light of Jesus. Until we look into them and only Jesus remains. So, so when we now read the, when we've seen Jesus for who he really is, we put our Jesus glasses on when we read the Old Testament. And we don't even really understand these until we see only Jesus in these stories. Jesus supersedes it all. He fulfills, which means fills full every word. It all looked forward to this very glorious person standing before them. And when they saw Jesus only, they were still seeing the law and the prophets personified. Remember when I said, you know, I'm trying to build a case that Moses and Elijah standing there are the personification of the Old Testament scriptures standing there? They're still seeing that. They're still seeing, but now they see only Jesus. (laughs) Because once they have him, Now they really get that message and they really understand it and they're still seeing it. I mean, Moses and Elijah may have delivered God's very word, but Jesus was God's clearest word. The Gospel of John says, the beginning was the word and the word was God, talking about Jesus. The the book of, the letter to the Colossians from Paul says that Jesus is the exact, he's like the exact representation of his being. When you're seeing Jesus, you're really seeing it all. These disciples need to know that uh, if Peter's going to be Pope, and I'm kind of joking when I say that, if he's going to be the first among the first apostles in the ultra-important next phase of God's plan, then he needs to know that he sees only Jesus when he looks up. And you and I need to know when we look into God's Word, if we're going to read it and feed on it, we need to know that. If we're going to teach it or share God's Word, we need to know that. That's what it's about. That's who it's about. That's who determines the meaning of it all. One last part of our story. Let's look at the reactions because we're talking about what kind of a difference should this make. Um, Mark gives the details about uh, the laundry idea that Jesus' clothes were brighter than any 
launderer would be able to get them. And, and well, it appears that the effect on the disciples may have required laundry as well. Because once God speaks into the situation, you think of that as God's Word interpreting what they're seeing. And God speaks out loud. Matthew has the three terrified and falling face down on the ground. Look at Jesus' next actions. I better get back to the book of Matthew. Look at Jesus' next actions. As they've fallen down terrified, God has laid down the law. This is, this is laying down the law. Listen to him. They fall on their faces. They're terrified. And look what happens. Look at Jesus' next actions. He comes over to them. He touches them. And he says, don't be afraid. That's Jesus' whole public ministry right there in three steps. That's what Jesus did when he came to this earth. He came, he touched, he said, don't be afraid. We studied 1 John recently. If you remember that, at the beginning of John's first of three epistles, near the end of your Bibles, you read this. And here's the three steps of came, touched, and the idea of don't fear. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. The one who is life was revealed to us, and we've seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you, what? That we don't need to fear. Why is that? Because he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father. Then He was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We're writing these things so you may, that you may fully share our joy. You don't have to be afraid. Jesus came. He touched us. And he gave us this message. Do not, don't be afraid. When Peter wrote about it, he said, For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So, seeing Jesus for who he is is foundational to our confidence and boldness in telling the message to others. It was foundational in what it took to make Peter, James, and John and the other disciples capital A apostles. That was a unique time in church. They, they were crucial for God's plan that they would see and know and be eyewitnesses to this thing. And then now our hope, our faith depends on what? The apostolic message. You see how connected it is in these men being eyewitnesses of who Jesus really is. But back to the reaction. They're pinned by fear when God booms out, listen to him. Um, it's an appropriate terror. It's a terrible thing to be suddenly enveloped, even if only in the cloud, in the presence of the Holy God, even more so to hear His voice directly. And on top of that, we can probably throw in the fact that, that the tone was probably corrective when God says, listen to Him. Um, Moses and Elijah, you see, they're not even in His league. They're perhaps two guys from the Hall of Fame of the minor leagues of God working out his plan. There's no disputing after this experience that Jesus is the preeminent one. From here on, the seminal disciple Peter and any who would call themselves disciples are to know that Jesus is the ultimate authority. Anything Moses and Elijah have to say or any other biblical author, they're all swallowed up in this ultimate point that they are revealed to be about Jesus. Jesus is that point. So God says, listen to him. And then we see this beautiful picture of the approach from Jesus. The touch, 
the uplift. The very first words given were told by a voice from heaven that terrifies us. Listen to him. And what are Jesus' first words? Get up, don't be afraid. I was texting with my sister this morning and I said to her, well, Nance, I got to go. I got to get into sermon mode. It's Jesus at the transfiguration. And the whole message of the Bible gets ciphered down into these two lines. Get up, don't be afraid. Now, that's just whistling in the dark. If it's just some new age guru out there saying, oh, you don't have anything to be afraid of. You just got to think. No, this is the enabling son of God. I don't think if it's not Jesus touching them, they're in that kind of terror, they don't get up. Jesus touches them, says, get up. These are enabling words. They get up and he says, do not be afraid. And he says the same thing to you and I. Here's a quote from my favorite commentator, For Jesus, shining is not just to impress, not even in the final analysis, just to make us obedient or trembling, which I would interpret as to put us in our place, but especially to help us up, to put us on our feet, to enable us to breathe again, so that we can be obedient to His Word and God's command to listen to Him. Listening. Listening, it's so much more than just auditory sound waves vibrating our eardrums. I I love to listen to music, but that's just basically a mood enhancement thing. It's a hobby, it's a pastime. Listening to Jesus is a whole life discipline. Listening to Jesus involves every part of us. You haven't listened if you've only heard. Uh, You don't have the power within you to obey unless you've heard and recognized it's Him, unless it's an enabling word through the Holy Spirit enabling you to even get up and not be afraid or do anything else that He commands us to. Listening to Christ is whole life. In what way will you practice focus on your listening this week? What are some of the hearing aids available to you I just want to close in warning you, there's so many voices competing for your attention. What God says to Peter, he says to us, listen to him. Listen to him. What Jesus says to Peter, he says to us, get up, don't be afraid. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would um, enable us to put full confidence in this eyewitness report. I don't think we're going to expect in our lifetime to have some mountaintop experience where your son is uh, standing before us in his full glory. We know he'll return that way, and the whole world will see him. But right now, so much of our hope, Lord, depends on the eyewitness account of these three men who saw that. And by your Spirit, we're enabled to understand the significance of it. That it's a whole different category of authority. So we confess sometimes our, we confess our, um, the way that we underestimate how complete Jesus' authority is. Help us to see him the way that you do. Help us to worship him closer to some semblance of something that's worthy of his greatness. Help us to obey with more of a semblance of showing an appreciation for who it is that claims to be Lord of our life and help us to uh, from there have the courage to not be afraid of anything else if God is for us who could be against us we ask these things in Jesus name Amen